All right, so you, Dr. Cabral, you're a naturopathic medicine uh, doctor, and you're also an Ayurvedic medicine practitioner, and they're seemingly opposing viewpoints when it comes to, to medicine. You know, one is based in Western medicine and another one is yes. based in Eastern medicine. Do they counter each other? Do they work well together? When is it appropriate to use Ayurvedic medicine? Where is it more appropriate to use Western medicine? And let's get into that conversation, I guess. Yeah, I, in my honest opinion, I believe everyone should have a MD and an ND, or at least some type of integrative health practitioner that they're working with. Okay. So you have your medical doctor on one side that's going to look at any disease-based issues in the short term, and then you're going to work with your natural health practitioner or naturopathic doctor to find out what are all the underlying root causes that could lead to these diseases in the first place. Okay. So in conventional medicine, what we're really worried about is it's binary. You either have the disease or you don't, right? You have rheumatoid arthritis or you don't. It's in remission, right? Or you have multiple sclerosis or you don't. So all we're looking at is blood work. And the problem is that there's so much that goes wrong in the body from what's called the homeostatic systems that starts to become imbalanced. And that happens over months or years that eventually leads to the disease. So by working with a naturopathic doctor or some type of integrative based practitioner, that they can find those things through other blood work, or I should say other lab work besides blood work. Mm. So they can do urine testing, they can do, which is great for hormones. They can do urine, uh, sorry, uh, saliva testing for hormones, urine testing for gut-based issues, stool testing for gut issues, blood work for thyroid and for digestive-based issues as okay. well, as well as omega-3s. So what I like to say is conventional medicine is the very best in the world for acute-based conditions. Heart attack, stroke, bilateral pneumonia, injuries, you go to your, your medical specialist. Mm -hmm. But for everything else, if you have high cholesterol, any of the highs, right, high blood pressure, the only option for a medical doctor, and that's because they're liable for this, that's why it's like, it's not the MD's fault. Mm -hmm. It's the American Medical Association that teaches this and the insurance companies that say they have to do this. If you have high cholesterol and you don't give someone a statin, you're liable. Mm -hmm. Why didn't you give them that statin? What if they have a heart attack? Your job is to give them the statin. If you have high blood pressure, you're giving them a calcium channel blocker or a beta blocker or something to bring down their blood pressure. Because if they have a stroke with high blood pressure and you didn't do that, you have, you're, you're basically malpractice based. Got it. So in natural medicine, what we do is we say, we understand that all these things exist, but we believe that those symptoms of high cholesterol, that high cholesterol is a set of symptoms of some type of inflammatory process that happens with some type of digestive based issues or inability to, to digest or eat those particular foods or from inflammation or from hormones, many different things based on genetics and lifestyle. So we look at all the underlying root causes that then lead to the health issues later in life. Okay, so uh, Western medicine uh, addresses the symptoms. Let's, let's yes. crush the symptoms. Uh, the other forms of medicine like Ayurvedic medicine, we're looking at the root cause. And so you're using both, you're using both the, the, the Western approach with the, I guess, Eastern approach. When is it, is it always both or is it more appropriate to use one over the other depending on the circumstance? So like what are these, what are the strengths of, for example, Ayurvedic medicine? Right. Well, we, so with Ayurvedic medicine, we're looking at the 6,000 year old tradition of balancing the body. So okay. we're looking at body types. We're looking at balancing the body overall, looking at digestion, all the different things. And then in naturopathic medicine, which is basically, so if you look at it this way, Naturopathic medicine is just the same science-based medicine, only you are using um, vitamins, herbs, lifestyle, and you're actually looking at hormone levels and digestive levels to fix the things that then cause the disease that are then treated in conventional You're just medicine. not using pharmaceuticals? No pharmaceuticals. So you Got go it. on two different paths. One uses pharmaceuticals, one uses diet, exercise, lifestyle, sleep, all of those modalities to rebalance the body. Now, Ayurveda teaches you how to rebalance the body. Okay. You know, if someone's too sympathetic nervous system dominant, too much fight or flight, they need more balance within rest. That, that includes foods, that includes maybe things like softer massage versus harder massage. So we look at all of those um, types of things to rebalance the body. Okay, so what are some symptoms of uh, be, having too much of a sympathetic system activation? Which is, let's explain the two, I guess, uh, syst autonomic systems, the sympathetic and parasympathetic, and, uh, and then do we see more of the sympathetic in, in today's uh, patients, for example? So, without a doubt, in the Western-based society where we're always on the go, there's deadlines, there's you know, issues with kids and school and work and relationships, and then we do really hard workouts on top of it because we're promoting like the hardest workout, the most competitive workout, every day is a PR, like that, right. all those things ramp up the uh, cortisol response. So we look at that as basically the brain is just getting signals from your environment. Now it can be your internal environment in your gut, maybe there's something wrong with digestive-based issues or the world around you. And the hypothalamus is telling the pituitary gland to send signals to the adrenals to produce adrenaline. As the body produces adrenaline, we increase heart rate, 
We increase blood pressure typically. Sweating can begin to um, uh, increase as well. You start to get more anxious, okay. irritable, overwhelmed. These are all symptoms of that sympathetic nervous system. And then we produce more cortisol. Cortisol actually makes you feel great in the beginning. Like you're just revved up and you're ready to go. The problem is that cortisol is no problem in the short term. Over the long term, it begins to really wear down the body. It wears down the nervous system and it also starts to deplete the positive hormones, the progesterone in women mm -hmm. and the testosterone DHEA in men. Wow, so so one of the so sympathetic is that fight or flight response, right? Yes. That I'm up, I'm energized, I'm go, 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 uh, which I, you know, makes sense. Most people, I guess, in, in Western societies probably live in that state yes. most of the time and we feed that state, right, with caffeine and stuff like that. But you mentioned low testosterone. Um, it, it, so it's, it's, it naturally lowers testosterone to be in that state all of the time. So what happens is, and again, so this is the difference between conventional and then natural-based medicine, is conventional medicine, you go and you have low testosterone, you might be prescribed some type of hormone-based therapy for low testosterone. Right. But in natural medicine, we'd say, you know, you're 45 years old. Why would you have low testosterone? That doesn't make any sense. Right. So, and especially like even earlier than that. So we'd say, okay, well, what are the things that lower testosterone? Maybe there's a depletion of B vitamins. Maybe there's a depletion of zinc, a depletion of uh, vitamin C, or that there's higher levels of cortisol. And what happens is we're in fight or flight, the body downregulates other processes. So if the body's gonna shift more of its hormone towards cortisol in the fight or flight, mm. it knows that in the short term it raises DHEA and testosterone, but chronic stress decreases DHEA. And if it decreases DHEA, it hurts immune function. And then the um, precursor to testosterone is DHEA. So then we see the thing below it. Mm. If there's not enough DHEA, there's not gonna be enough of the thing below it, which is testosterone. So we see that become a huge issue. And the other issue we see is that if the body's in a toxic-based state, and we can talk about that, but even a stress-based state, they can also oftentimes be a conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone, which okay. is not the version that we want. It makes men lose their hair, it causes prostate inflammation, mm -hmm. they grow hair on their back. So what we do is we reduce the stressors. Yes, we'll replace the vitamins, maybe the B vitamins, the not just B12, but vitamin B6 and folate, methylfolate. We'll do the zinc, we'll do all of those items, but we'll also give healing herbs from Ayurveda, such as ashwagandha. Uh, we might use things such as fossil serine, or we'll use something to rhodiola, which gives you a little bit of boost, but doesn't get you get you too high. It'll help adapt. Mm -hmm. So it's called an adaptogen, it helps bring you back down under stress mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, ashwagandha, I think I, I saw some recent studies showing that it actually raised testosterone in hypogonadal men or men with low testosterone pretty consistently. But it does that. That's the good thing. It does not raise testosterone the way that we think that it does. It doesn't directly raise testosterone. That's right. It lowers cortisol. Oh, so then you get so that. So then you get the testosterone okay, boost. So that's why you're always asking why. Like, why testosterone? And if you always ask why, you'll find an answer eventually. So yes, ashwagandha, uh, if we were just putting together a testosterone formula, it would have ashwagandha. Because ashwagandha, like, so if you use um, tribulus, that can boost testosterone by itself. But ashwagandha actually lowers cortisol, mm. which then pushes the lever. So if it's a lever, high cortisol, Got it. You know, then you can just bounce it back. And so that's how it boosts mm. testosterone. Speaking of tribulus, would that be a good combination then? Tribulus with ashwagandha, one directly affecting testosterone, one lowering cortisol to allow testosterone to raise. Would that be a good combination? So tribulus in the short term, but I wouldn't say for extended period of use, maybe 12 to 16 weeks, give okay. yourself that boost. Use ashwagandha plus your B vitamins plus magnesium, things to calm that parasympathetic maybe yeah that's that's absolutely what i do there's so many more things you could do but that will lower the stress levels okay. start to get to bed a little bit earlier uh get more restful sleep and then you can we wean off of okay. the uh, tribulus and some of the symptoms of low testosterone low libido uh, low muscle mass weakness yes. uh, less motivation do you now i've been reading that over the last maybe five decades i believe that the the general testosterone levels in men has been slowly dropping which to me says that they're probably changing the range of what's considered normal. Whereas a, a normal testosterone level today, what would be considered normal today, may be considered low, you know, 30 years ago. Where do you like to see men's testosterone levels? What do you consider to be healthy for men in the upper to normal range? Or what, what are some numbers that you like to so see? That's where we go back to Ayurvedic based medicine, because that's why men need to be testing their testosterone levels as a teenager let's say peak, somewhere around 18 years oh, old. Oh, so we know what their, their standard is. Exactly. Right? Okay. Like, how do we know? I mean, if I have guys that come in over the range, but when they were 18, they might have been like even another 50% higher. Oh, I so see. So like, that's normal for them. They're not in a heightened state. So, and if we look at Ayurvedic-based medicine, we understand that there's three main body types and then 10 total subtypes. We've got the ectomorph, we've got the mesomorph, 
And then we have the endomorph, right? In mm -hmm. Ayurveda, it's the vata, the pitta, and the kapha, but the same thing, just much more in depth. Well, that mesomorph is, for female and male, is going to produce more testosterone. Okay. The vata is going to have the least or the ectomorph, and the endomorph will be right in the middle. Even though the endomorph is the larger body type, does not not mean they produce the most amount of testosterone. Now, it fits very well with the mesomorph in the first place because you mentioned a few of those, but one of the worst symptoms of, honestly, is low testosterone isn't necessarily the lower muscle mass or, you know, strength. It's the low ambition, the low drive, the like the no get up and go. Yeah. Like you just like, you just kind of blah. And mm -hmm. that's such a bad symptom because then you don't even want to get to the gym. You don't even want to eat the right foods. You just, and so you're not into life. Right. So one of the reasons we want to boost testosterone is so that we give guys back like their life, their energy, mm -hmm. really important. So uh, I've done hormone tests through a company that we work with called Everlywell. Um, and it's, they, they use saliva. Do you recommend uh, men and women test the hormone levels as they start to change variables in their lifestyle to see what is giving yes. them the best impact? And how often would you recommend tests like that? That's a great question because you can't throw the whole kitchen sink at it unless you want to continue with the whole kitchen sink. Yeah, because you don't know what's doing you what. You don't know what, yeah, exactly. So that, that's why. Try three variables at the most. Okay. I like to even say, if you're okay with one, but the problem with one is that it could take you really long to get your results. Got it. So we start with like a foundational-based program that we know like, okay, we're going to replace these things. We're going to try to lower cortisol levels. And don't test testosterone in isolation. Okay, good. That's great. What's your cortisol? Okay. What's your estrogen? What's your DHEA? What's your progesterone? I see. You need to look at those, and ideally, if you can get thyroid in there as well, then you'll see how the hormonal, the endocrine system is actually functioning. Interesting. So again, conventional medicine, naturopathic medicine do the same exact thing. How we go about it is different. We want to look at holistically how the body works. In conventional medicine, they won't care what your cortisol levels are. If you have low testosterone, you have low testosterone. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But what if you have high cortisol levels and low testosterone? We're like, oh, well, that makes sense. In my practice, actually, we see depleted levels, lower levels of cortisol. Maybe not Addison's disease, of course, but lower level and lower levels of testosterone. So both. Yeah, that just tells us, okay, the person's been in a chronic state of stress for a long time. Now they're depleted on their hormones. Oh, that their body's like in a crap. shutdown state. Exactly. Mm. You also mentioned uh, uh, in women, uh, progesterone estrogen. Um, and what do you see, what's, what's more common with women? In men, we see lower testosterone. What are we seeing that's happening in women? In women, we see a combination of estrogen dominance, and it's not from high levels of estrogen. That happens in some women, but in 9 out of 10 women, women with estrogen dominance, it's normal levels of estrogen, and it's lower levels of progesterone. Okay. So what happens is, again, how it affects them is if you're under stress and you're producing that norepinephrine, and you're producing the cortisol, it's going to, it's called the cortisol steel. It's going to take the precursor. So just like we said, uh, the precursor to testosterone was DHEA, dihydroepiandosterone. Mm -hmm. The precursor to cortisol is progesterone. Okay. So it's going to directly filter down to cortisol when you're under stress. If you're under stress, that takes precedence. It's a survival-based situation. Now, it might just be that you're in rush hour traffic, you're trying to get home, you're trying to make a meeting, whatever it is. That's still stress. Your body doesn't know. Sure. That's simply stress on the peripheral nervous system. Mm. So what happens is we start to get those lower levels of progesterone. Now, you get all the feelings of high estrogen, even though estrogen is normal but that's still estrogen dominance. So you get the, maybe the acne around the chin, you get some bloating, you get lower mood, you get irritability, uh, you might get some facial hair growth. Uh, so all of those issues can come and sometimes they happen maybe just the five days or so before your cycle starts as a female, mm. or maybe you're experiencing the most of the month and that can be just severely depleted levels of progesterone. Oh, so uh, with, with estrogen dominance, would women then see uh, like se more severe symptoms of like PMS or traditional PMS? That's absolutely correct, yes. Wow. Because around day 21 to day 23 of their cycle, they should be at their highest level of progesterone. So how a female cycle works is the uh, follicular-based phase, estrogen is at its highest loop like this. Okay. And then progesterone is in an inverse ratio. And it goes like that. So as estrogen 21. goes down, progesterone goes up. Exactly, during the luteal phase. Okay. So day 21 to day 23 is when you'd want to test. You don't just test at any time. You go to your doctor, you get a lab test that you can test at home, and you take your progesterone five days to seven days before you okay, get this is very important because if you don't test it at the right time, then it's not going to help Data doesn't mean anything. Yeah, wow, it means okay. Nothing. And when was it that they needed to do this? Let's uh, repeat this. About five days to seven days maximum before they get their period, day one of menstruation, or their highest level of symptoms of estrogen dominance. Because okay. then you'll be able to see it. But it should be within that week period Got because it. that's when progesterone should be at its highest. So a progesterone, again, progesterone is most likely going to be within range because the range is so huge. It's like right. vitamin D. Right. Vitamin D is supposed to be between 30 and 100. Okay, well, that's an enormous range. Healthy is 50 to 70 or maybe 50 to oh, 80. Oh, I see. Just because you're 30 in vitamin D doesn't mean you're getting the immune boosting benefits or any of the hormone benefits. Okay. Right? So we want progesterone to be at its peak around day 21 to day 23 of that luteal phase, five days to seven days before mm -hmm. uh, day one of menstruation. And then estrogen should be toward its mm -hmm. lowest. 
Now, I've also heard, actually, you talked about this. We just recorded a podcast that cellulite um, actually starts to show up more um, when women with, who have estrogen dominance, um, where they start to, in, women don't want cellulite, right? That's right. a not look good looking uh, type of body fat. What are some dietary things and lifestyle things women can do if they suspect that they're estrogen dominant to help balance things out? So we want to look at inflammation and its role in retaining water in the body and then leading to also fat gain. Okay. So if we look at higher blood sugar levels leading to more insulin production, leading to this thing called interleukin-6, which then creates more inflammation. And if there's higher levels of inflammation, it's gonna raise cortisol. And if we raise cortisol, we're most likely going to what? Cause more estrogen in the body. Mm. We're gonna drop testosterone, we're gonna drop progesterone, we're gonna see this influx of um, estrogen. So there's a couple things we need to do. Besides the whole stress thing that we chatted about, we need to increase all of the things that are going to block excessive or the more um, toxic forms of estrogen, okay. which would be sulfur-based vegetables, cruciferous vegetables. So, so more broccoli? Broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, all of those are okay. great. Yep, absolutely work great. Now, they can be cooked as well, because a lot of you know people have issues with them uncooked. And um, a, a lot of greens powders will work as well for that. Okay. Um, any product with dim uh, will work for women as well. Other things that work great are infrared saunas. Amazing things is dry brushing. It takes you two minutes before you get in the shower every morning. Dry brush the cellulite-based areas. Oh. Move that lymphatic system. So what is dry brushing exactly? Is it literally what it sounds like? I get a dry brush and just... Yes, literally. So, okay. But it's a, it's a brush that's specifically meant for dry brushing. Got it's it. like massage. So here's the thing. All of this goes back to Ayurvedic medicine. All of this was written 6,000 years ago. It's the, it's the original form of medicine. We've just kind of updated certain things for our, more of our Western-based mindset. So your, lymph, your lymphatic system actually has four times the amount of fluid of all the blood in your body. But it, it's different than your heart, which is automatic. Your lymphatic system moves when you move okay. or you move it. So with the dry brushing, we simply, and we move towards the heart. So because we have to move up to this thing called the greater thoracic duct. Got it. So we're always moving to the lymph nodes behind the knees, the groin, the armpits, the neck down. So we're basically we're dry brushing, just push down one to three millimeters. That's it. Okay. And our Western based mentality, we're like, we're just gonna yeah. crank Scrape down. Scrape the massage. skin right off your leg. Yeah. <laughs> Take the skin off. So what we want to do though is just a gentle brush. You can even do a self massage with like sesame oil as well, a heating oil to move that lymphatic system because the area is retaining water. Uh, it's called the interstitial milieu, and you want to move all those toxins out. Another thing that leads to cellulite, we see more of it, is the plastics in the environment. Mm. Now, the plastics in the environment create more what's called exogenous, outside of the body, estrogen, that create more than in, in, endogenous production of estrogen mm. in the body. Mm. So if we remove a lot of the plastics, um, that will help as well. Mm. So uh, xenoestrogens, those are chemicals that act like estrogen in the That's body. Um, cosmetics, uh, you know, uh, hairsprays, stuff like that, deodorants, those things contain them? They do. Um, they contain those, uh, uh, obviously, the plastic bottles. It's oh, so hard right. to get away from it, but that's, that's a really big one. A lot of the plastic bottles, people don't know, they're transported on trucks that are not refrigerated. Oh, so the, so heat. the heat. Yeah. Exactly. So that's a, it's a big, big problem. Even if they're, um, I just get worried about plastics in general. Now, it's usually the bisphenol A um, that we're worried about, but really it's plastics in general. Okay. So we try to cut down our use of those. Uh, another big one that we talked about on the podcast is constipation. Mm. A lot of women that are constipated are actually absorbing estrogen metabolites. So every hormone has an N metabolite. Mm. Well, those N metabolites are usually just uh, removed in the stool as well. So if you're constipated, they can actually sit in the colon for an extra 12 hours or so and, not, and then be reabsorbed into the bloodstream. Now, it's a lesser form of estrogen, but it's still an estrogen-based metabolite that can then cause more cellulite or just more water retention, swelling, puffiness in general. Mm -mm. Okay, so uh, reduce stress, yes. um, increase cruciferous vegetable intake, yes. um, make sure you're not constipated so you have good digestion. And uh, did I miss anything? Sweating, oh, the dry, dry brushing. Dry brushing. Sweating. Infrared sauna. Uh, I would say rebounding to move that lymphatic system. Okay. Even just jump roping or just jumping up and down is a great one. And the last one is control your omega-6s to your omega-3s. Okay. If you have a diet that's high in processed foods or high in omega-6s, even roasted nuts. A lot of people are eating too many roasted nuts, which can be higher in the omega-6s because mm. they've been roasted in oil that's higher in polyunsaturated oh, right, fats. Right. Um, so try to get more omega-3s. That could be from a wild-caught fish. It could be even something like seaweed snacks, like oh, an okay. easy way to get omega-3s that way in iodine uh, or take an omega-3 supplement. All right. Well, excellent. This has been very informative. Thank you very much. My pleasure. All right. So check it out. If you have any questions, put it in the comments below. I'll visit periodically to answer those for you. Also, subscribe to our channel. We post new videos all the time.